An honorable profession is brought to you by Tech for America, an organization dedicated to providing a platform to solve America's toughest public challenges. For more information, visit t4a.org. That's t, the number four, a.org. We're also supported by opencounter.com. OpenCounter builds tools for local governments to deliver permits and licenses online. Their portals make complex permitting simple, which lowers transaction costs, increases transparency, and empowers economic development. OpenCounter is a vital tool for communities across this nation, including Atlanta, Charlotte, Oakland, Indianapolis, and San Diego. Check out opencounter.com to see what they can do for your community. Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm your host, Ryan Coonerty. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports some of the most thoughtful and innovative voices in American politics. I've been a member of New Deal for years, both when I was mayor of Santa Cruz and now as chair of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Check out some of our past episodes with guests like Mayor Pete, Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, Florida Representative Margaret Good, and more than a dozen amazing leaders at the state and local level. You can find us at newdealleaders.org or wherever podcasts are found. And if you like what you hear, please tell your friends. We're trying to bring sanity to politics in an insane era. We need all the help we can get. Get ready to meet Anthony Daniels. He was an elementary school teacher in Huntsville, Alabama, when he realized he needed to get more involved. He ran for the state Senate and lost. He licked his wounds, he learned, and he ran for the state house and won. Now the 36-year-old is the youngest and first African-American minority leader in the history of the Alabama state house. He's fighting for his state's kids and democracy while rebuilding the Democratic Party in Atlanta. I hope you enjoy hearing his remarkable story as much as I did. So, Anthony Daniels, welcome to An Honorable Profession. I'm so glad to be talking to you today. Oh, great talking to you as well. I want to talk about how an elementary school in Huntsville, Alabama, decides he's going to run for elected office and uh, become the first African-American minority leader in the, in the history of the state. Tell me about your journey. Well, uh, my journey began early on, um, you know, just to preface and put things in perspective, I was primarily raised by my grandparents, and so uh, really was raised around an older soul, and so that's something that uh, has really prepared me for for today. Uh, and so, uh, going to Alabama A and M University, you got a lot of old souls in the legislature, I assume. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it makes sense for me. <laughs> and so, you know, thought that uh, athletics was my ticket out of my community to the rest of the world in order to give back to my community. Uh, ended up tearing my ACL. Uh, I played point guard. I've been 6'3 since seventh grade. I've uh, played um, with Amari Stoudemire, who uh, was played had a, a stellar career in the NBA. We were teammates in AAU. Uh, and so, you know, I thought that that was my ticket out of the community. Um, but after tearing my ACL and going through that period of understanding and, and, and really faced with reality that, you know, being a professional athlete was really no no longer uh, the chances of me being a professional athlete was was less likely, uh, and so I uh, wanted to I tried to figure out what is it that I could do um, to give back to my community and really be impactful and give to communities in general, and that's when I majored in elementary education, uh, went to Alabama A and M University, uh, but you know my journey started as a student member of the Student Alabama Education Association, which is an affiliate. A, affiliate of the NEA. And so I became a local president and state president. Uh, and then I became, I was elected the first African-American male elected chairman of the National Education Association student program. So I had to leave, coll- uh, leave college and turn, uh, go to D.C. and work out of the NEA headquarters, where I became the spokesperson for the college affordability campaign. And at that particular time, I put all of my eggs in that basket of uh, focusing all of my attention on the college affordability campaign because I felt that uh, for a, as a leader, uh, you're focusing on increasing membership and increasing engagement. And I felt that that issue would solve, uh, would kill two birds, one stone. And so uh, it was 
a mentor of mine, uh, John Stocks, that had a conversation with me during my time at NEA. And that time he was the deputy executive director of NEA. And so he told me that your legacy will, what, what will people say about you after you leave? And what type of impact will you leave? And so that kind of got me thinking about, uh, you know, the College Afford Affordability Campaign. And a year and a half into my term as chair of the NEA student program, uh, the College Access and Reduction Act passed. And so uh, that kind of helped me put in perspective and understand the importance that policy uh, have over our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and so I returned to Huntsville, uh, taught third grade at a public magnet school with high parental involvement, uh, taught fourth grade at a Title I school with low parental involvement, and I taught fourth-fifth grade combo on an Indian reservation between Albuquerque and Santa Fe, New Mexico at Cochiti, uh, which was practically no parental involvement. And but understanding that as a young classroom teacher, I was making a difference and, and, and really uh, was a mentor, a role model uh, for many of the young people that are in, in the schools that I taught in. But I knew that as a policymaker, my impact will be much greater. And so that's why I decided to run for public office. And uh, you use the word mentor there. And I, I've noticed when I read through interviews uh, with you, you talk about mentors a lot, including um, you, the woman you lost your first race to. Uh, yeah. ter be your opponent became your mentor. Talk about, because um, uh, there may be some listeners out there who are trying to find their way and maybe they're interested in public service, maybe they're interested in education. Um, how did you develop mentors? What's your approach to, to finding people uh, who can support you and your goals to make your community a better place? Well, it, it depends on what you're looking for, right? If you're looking uh, in the public service to be in public service in general, or if you're looking to be in politics. Uh, for me, um, identifying a number of people, identifying business mentors, because I'm a small business owner, uh, but also identifying mentors in the legislature, uh, people that have, had a, that have already done what I'm trying to do. And so really looking, uh, and, and, and it really just happened. Uh, you know, I, I drive her down to the legislature. Some people say, you're really not a legislator. You're just Laura Hall's driver. <laughs> uh, and so I accept that. But I, I will tell you that having someone like Representative Hall who has a servant's heart and that's doing it for the right reason is really what drew, drew me to her. Uh, knowing that what she tells me is going to be based upon her knowledge and experience and, and based upon her outlook on the world. And so I listen. But not everyone can turn a, a political opponent into a mentor. What do you focus on to build those personal relationships? Obviously, time in a car always helps. Uh, but uh, but, it's, but it, that takes a, it takes a special kind of person to develop a relationship with a political opponent. Well, I, I didn't take it personal. Uh, during the campaign, for me, uh, it was about chess. Even when I ran for, ran against her for, in the primary for the state senate, uh, it was all about a chess match. And in chess, what you're doing is you're living, you're really preparing for the, uh, another day, uh, to live another day. And so for me, I knew that if I had gone negative on Representative Hall, it would have had an impact on my ability to corral the people that are that that support her. And so for me, it was being, you know, making certain that I'm being myself, um, being a nice person, uh, and but also seeking advice and, and asking her for different things. But I think for her uh, to see me in a different light, not as a political opponent, but someone, a young man that's trying to find his way and that she felt, uh, you know, I think that she felt uh, really drawn to me in saying that, you know, this young man uh, has the ability to to take po this po politics as far as he want to take it or or, or have a, a, the ability to to really make a difference. And so at, when you're talking to a lot of individuals out there, uh, you they want to know that you care. Uh, they don't care how much you know, but until they know how much you care. It's just like children. Right. They don't. And so with Representative Hall, she saw me working hard and saw that, uh, you know, I was go going over and beyond to work. And so that work ethic is something that I think really draw, drew her uh, to saying that, you know, I can really work with this young man. And, and for me, um, I'm a person, I'm straight up, I'm straightforward. Uh, I've, I've never wronged anyone in my life, you know, because I don't, I don't have that in me. It, it, for me, it's about what, how are we going to move the needle? And so if you're a part of it, I want you to be a part of the team. If you're not, then I will work around you. Uh, most of my friends, I would tell you, are twice my age. 
And so I've learned from people that have been in politics as an advocate or individuals that have served in politics. And I'm still learning. Even today, uh, I had uh, a, a member of the legislature said to me, um, because they realized that I'm burning the highway up a, a whole lot and, and said to me that you really got to take more time for your family. One of the things that I regret not doing as a lawmaker is that I didn't spend enough time with my family. And so that's something that, you know, I had to sit, really sit down and look at and say, you know, I'm doing all this stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, am I taking care of my family? You know, am I spending enough time with my kids? Am I making certain that my family feel like they are partners in this? And so now I'm at a point to where I try not to uh, spend a whole lot of time away from home outside of the legislative session or I make arrangements for my family to be able to travel with me. And so, you know, I have a one year old and a three year old and I don't want to be away from home to where my one year old starts walking. And so that's why I try to make certain that I'm, I'm, a, I'm around and that that I'm, I'm really, you know, doing what I need to do as a father and as a husband first. Uh, but it wasn't always like that. It, but it took me really coming across someone that was willing to share that with me to really l get me to look at the big picture. And so right now, not that I've neglected my family, but it's just that sometimes you don't you're in this situation. You don't realize what's going on around you because you're you're working. You're, you're running a straight line. Yeah. And you're I mean, you've had a remarkable journey because you got elected to the state legislature. And then within your first term, you get elected majority leader or minority leader. And that has uh, that has a whole different set of responsibilities. Uh, and can you talk about the difference between being a legislator and being in leadership and what that does to your schedule? And also a big part about being in leadership is knowing when to fight and knowing when to compromise uh, within your caucus, even if it's even if it may not be your own personal beliefs. Can you talk about what that's like? Well, it, it is certainly a, um, a um, difference in time commitment. Uh, you go from being a legislator to where uh, just representing your district and really uh, doing a lot of things from within your district to really being over the entire state, um, focusing on recruiting candidates. Uh, when I took over in February 2017, I had observed the actions of our caucus and the actions of the body in general. And so at that particular time, seeing the extremes on both sides in the debate, I didn't see any movement. And so my style of negotiating on behalf of my caucus has given me the ability to leverage things that it may not be 100 percent of what we want, but this gets us where we need to be. And it also builds trust on the other side that you're not just going to be bomb throwers for four years. And for me, at the end of the day, it's not about serving in leadership just to have another title. It's about leveraging and it's about negotiating and it's about being strategic. And so I had uh, less than one year or one year uh, to be exact um, to recruit candidates. And so I recruited 42 additional candidates in one year. Um, and and you, you have to think about what is it, uh, how do you do that? Well, I use a headhunter to help me identify the prospects that I've developed. I developed five star to one star, uh, which is what most uh, football coaches do. And so what I was able to do is identify the um, the the characteristics or the profession or the background of those individuals that I'm looking for. And let that set as uh, serve as the foundation for the headhunter to identify prospects within the various districts. So that cut my time in half uh, where this should have been done three to four years before I took over. But there was nothing there was nothing. No one had been recruited. The fundraising, I had to develop a pack. And so you had to do fundraising, recruitment and galvanizing and also governing all at the same time. But I, I was very fortunate to have um, mentors like Representative Laura Hall that helped me avoid the mistakes that she's seen in the past while having other individuals that was on the road meeting with these pros prospective candidates. Uh, and I was more of the, the closer in that. And so uh, I had one year to d do something in one year that should have been done over a four year period. Uh, and so, you know, we were able to to get it done. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a strong state party in Alabama, and so I had to serve sort of as a de facto party leader. And so I'd raise money um, for the gubernatorial candidate, 
I uh, raised money for the lieutenant governor candidate. Uh, I helped some of the senators. And I uh, developed infrastructure for everyone that a party should have done. And so I felt like I spread myself too thin. Uh, and there was no it was only seven thousand dollars in the bank when I took over. And we were able to exceed about one point five million in, in, in a 12 month period. Alabama is a is a deeply red state. Talk about what your vision is for moving it into purple and maybe someday into blue. How do you how do you keep going when you have so little infrastructure for your party uh, in a place? And how do you build a path to victory? Well, what what has happened is this last cycle, I was able to get uh, some new, younger, energetic members into our caucus. And so really building a an official structure and, and members are they see now the vision. Uh, they were skeptical because who is this young guy that's going to come and tell us how we've we've been doing it for a number of years. And so I've in, I've, I've engaged them in the process, uh, giving responsibilities to members uh, doing things like town hall meetings in their districts. None of this was done before. And so I built the trust of the members. Uh, one of the things that we're going to have to do in order to really move Alabama uh, to purple at some point is voter registration. Uh, there's approximately about 291,000 unregistered, um, last time I checked, unregistered people of color in Alabama. That makes up a win number in a gubernatorial race and a, a, a presidential race. And people of color are likely, more likely to vote for the most progressive candidate without saying, uh, you know, you know what I mean on that. Uh, the other thing is civic engagement, engaging uh, the public around issues. We did um, town hall meetings across the state, issue based town hall meetings. Uh, we did listening sessions. We did 10 listening sessions. And then we went into the issue based town hall meetings on issues that we knew pe there was some commonality among people that are Democrat and Republican. Uh, criminal justice reform was one of them. One of those issues uh, we we looked at, um, you know, issues in education. Uh, I did a town hall about three weeks ago on medical marijuana and Medicaid expansion. And so. Doing those issue-based town hall meetings has allowed us an opportunity to build our email list up. And so now we're able to communicate with, with our constituents around the state. We've increased our social media presence, uh, the engagement on the social media. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, before I uh, became minority leader, the, the caucus didn't even have a website. And so it was it was really uh, they were just, you know, there was no very little movement. And so right now, I think that with the level of engagement, uh, and my role as leader in the negotiations that are happening, we're able to get some of the things done. Uh, I uh, supported a gas tax, but I leveraged other things because I knew that the Republicans would not have the votes to pass a gas tax. And so they needed me in my caucus. And so I was able to leverage getting some the bills that we want, um, you know, on the calendar, things like criminal justice reform, and also increase the conversations around Medicaid expansion and what, what does that look like for Alabama? How do we get there? Uh, and, and more funding in higher ed, especially with our HBCUs, and making certain that equity is, is a priority, and also working in, in, in other different pockets. It makes us, it puts us at the table instead of being always on the table. And so although we're in a uh, supermarket minority, uh, we're able to, I'm able to operate within the framework and, and what's being dealt to me. Uh, if we, if the numbers were closer, I probably would take a different approach, but I, I have to adopt as, a, a, adapt as a leader to the times. And, and so we are where we are. And so I have to make certain that effectiveness is the priority as opposed to the partisanship. There are some members that have been in the legislature for a number of years. They were in the legislature when Democrats were in the majority before 2010. But I've had to, you know, we've had to have some real tough conversations and say, look, fighting for the sake of fighting without having understanding what the end game is, is really not good for your district. What are we delivering? Are we going to fight for four years and not deliver anything for our constituents? Or are we going to work and compromise and work on things that uh, could have some type in a bipartisan manner in order to gain leverage uh, and influence up in other areas for our constituents. Because at the end of the day, we're here to serve the people that are in our districts, Democrat or Republican. And so when you're a rep elected representative, you're governing, you have to govern. Campaign season is over. 
a lot of young and new members uh, that on both sides of the aisle uh, were still in campaign mode. But our members are understand the end game and it's all about the end game. And so uh, until that happens, uh, we're not going to be able to make the gains that we need to make. I think there are opportunities uh, for the civic engagement, voter registration, voter education piece. I think you start there and place a lot of investments in that area. And I think that once you start going into the next cycle, the, the, the momentum will be going. Uh, the problem with uh, Democrats and progressives in general is that we've never learned how to play defense because we've been in charge for so long. And so uh, Republicans are good bomb throwers when they're in the minority. But when they're in the majority, they are very aggressive uh, as as it relates, you know, to governing and Democrats are very nice in trying to be, you know, conciliatory or whatever and, and be open to helping Republicans get certain things done. But that's not necessarily the case a lot of times for the Republicans. And so Democrats don't know how to play from behind and Republicans don't really understand how to govern. And so for me as a leader, Hell, I've been playing from behind my entire life. And so it's something that's natural and figuring out a way to put us in a position to be effective is, is really what my focus is. There's a real tension in what you're talking about, which is uh, to play good defense, to make clear your statement of values, but then to govern is to compromise and to find pick your spots. Um, how has that message resonated with both your caucus and with the voting public in terms of, you know what, this gas tax, we didn't get everything we want or close to everything we got we want, but we got these few things, and for that reason, we're going to be in support. How do you communicate that calculus to folks? And so what I did, um, I talked about supporting the gas tax in a conditional way in the first town hall meeting. So we had town hall meetings before the gas tax vote. And then right after the gas tax, that gas tax was voted on um, on a Thursday, I think, and I had a town hall meeting on that Monday. And I started the town hall meeting off by saying, yes, I voted for the gas tax and I'll vote for it again. I talked about the things that we were able to get in, the language for disadvantaged um, enterprises, businesses, uh, to be able to have a shot at getting contracts and opportunities and how that impact our economy and the growth of our economy. Uh, I talked about the conversations that we've had, I've had with the governor around issues that impact uh, a lot of the people um, that, you know, that I represent. Uh, and so right now we're, we're having conversations about uh, and bills on the lottery. Uh, criminal justice reform is something that we're moving, uh, trying to move through through the legislature. Uh, the big ticket item, Medicaid expansion, is what we really want. Uh, we're trying to figure out a way to get there uh, and have these serious conversations about how we get there and increase the understanding among people on both sides of the aisle and what does it actually mean. You know, 13 hospital closings uh, is serious business. With 21 expected to be the number uh, within the next two years if we don't do something about our health care system. And so, you know, having those conversations uh, help put in perspective to my constituents that, look, you either sit down and play defense from four, for four years and, you know, really excite the base and throw red meat to the base, or you figure out a way to position um, our community to get more uh, resources. And so I chose the latter. And so uh, for me, and, and I told my caucus this, if you want to vote against this gas tax, you can. I said, I wasn't around when when all of you were in the legislature and, and the things that have happened, the friction that have happened between Democrats and Republicans. But if the governor, you know, she gave me her word, I want to take her at her word. And if she's not, you know, being truthful, then we'll go back to it. We'll go to a different strategy. But for right now, uh, the strategy and the purpose right today is how do we get a seat at the table and get off the table as the meal? And that's the way that's what you've elected me to do. And that's what I'm going to do. And I'm willing to risk my entire um, leadership post on it. That's a that's a big challenge. Is this is this what you signed up for when you when you ran? Is this is this what you thought the job would be? Uh, and is it? I mean, it's a lot of time away from your family. It's hard work. Uh, it's not great uh, pay. Uh, so, you know, are you are you are you happy with it? And uh, and is it is it fulfilling? Because I mean, it's one thing 
to 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 build the party, it's gonna take it's gonna take time to do that. And, uh, and it's a long, hard slog. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of fights like this, gas tax fights and others ahead of you. Uh, what, do, what are you thinking about your experience? Well, I think that, you know, I would not trade this experience in for anything. Um, but I will tell you that what is, it has done for me is it's really allowed me to see uh, things beyond in a 10 to 20 year incre- increment. Understanding that, like to your point, it's going to take time to get to where you need to be. Um, I think that uh, with the election of uh, Donald Trump, I think that it helps me appeal more to moderates, um, whereas some, that process would have taken uh, 20 years if, that ha- if there had been a moderate Republican president that will now take, take about six uh, to eight years. And so I think that that is the bright spot, you know, bright point on that. And the other thing is we're beginning to see more uh, young people from northern Virginia and other places, uh, more progressive places, move to Huntsville and to Birmingham. And so and and right now we're beginning to see young folks, younger people running for um, office, whether it's mayor or city council, and their politics is going to attract more uh, young people to those cities. And so what I see is I see an increase in more progressive minded people. Uh, and, and I don't see the growth happening in, in traditional rural areas. And even the, the manufacturing jobs are attracting individuals with some technical skills. And so therefore, it's going to pull someone that have that someone has ha- that have had a more of a broader experience domestically and internationally uh, that comes in to Alabama and come to our communities with more of an open mind. Not to say that the people that are there don't have an open mind, um, but it's it it helps change the demographics a lot faster for in favor of a more progressive person, uh, and the conservatism will end up not necessarily being. Uh, being the label of our state long term, but more progressive minded individual, progressive uh, will will likely be where we will be long term. And in, in my community alone, um, we had a gubernatorial candidate that only had a person that was managing his office this last time in Madison County, Huntsville, and he only lost by 5%. And so Huntsville, uh, Madison County area where a lot of this growth is happening for these engineering jobs, you know, the tech jobs uh, are changing our de- shifting our demographics to being more progressive. And, um, you know, I see I see that being a benefit for us long term. Um, and, and the number of things that we've done within homes, we have the most PhDs per capita in the southeast, uh, you know, and, and, and a lot of educated people that live in that area, in, in the Huntsville area. And so um, I see uh, we will be the largest city in Alabama in six years, and so uh, if not before then. And so that's only going to make Alabama move more in a purple category long term if we're able to keep it going. And we've seen that that play out in North Carolina and in Georgia and Virginia, and it's, it's, I believe it's going to play out there. Make a pitch if you're a recent college graduate, um, progressive and interested in um, – Getting a good job, but also serving your community. Make a pitch for Alabama. Why should why should why should a recent college graduate uh, find their way to Huntsville or Birmingham? Well, I think that when you when you look at the cities cities like Huntsville and, and Birmingham and in, in Mobile and others, you're beginning to see a lot of the jobs moving back into the South. Uh, your the cost of living is uh, much cheaper. Uh, we have. Uh, right now, we have the best pre-K program. So if you want to start a family in Alabama, we have the best pre-K program in the country. Uh, however, only 32% of the children in the state have access to it. But that's changing. We've increased, added 193 more classrooms uh, to pre-K. Uh, and it's pre-K is free. Uh, and um, you're begin- we're beginning to see more uh, support from, for the, the, the pre-K areas. Uh, I just um, passed a bill two years ago uh, to bring a cybersecurity and engineering school to Huntsville. And so it will be a specialized school where, you know, the, the, the graduates of that high school 
uh, will the, the 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 will have more opportunity at getting uh, into you know the Georgia Techs and the other schools that are focusing on engineering the best you know and they'll be the best and the brightest and so uh, your children will have an opportunity uh, to go to that school if, if 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 you know if you're you're inclined or interested uh, we're we're looking at um, you know in our community college system. Uh, we we have we've implemented um, dual enrollment in our high schools where students some of the students can graduate with an associate's degree. Uh, we've doubled down on our um, vocational te and technical uh, skills, uh, where our board now instead of being an, an elected board, uh, where there it's it's industry leaders, and so they're making certain that the curriculum is reflecting that of the workforce, so that there's a a um, you know transition from high school or two-year uh, college into the workforce with very little debt. Uh, we're focusing on trying to get a lottery in Alabama so that we can pay for uh, the first two years of, of higher education. Uh, you're, you're beginning to see, um, you know, the opportunity for entre entrepreneurship is, is, is greater and cheaper in, in, in Alabama, especially in the Huntsville area. Um, our downtown has transformed to more condo living, more entertainment. Uh, in my district, which is the beer district, we have more microbreweries in my district than than anywhere else in the state of Alabama. Uh, they've turned around communities, uh, and and so there'll be an opportunity, uh, be opportunities there uh, to buy uh, um, at a much lower rate. Um, I have a two bedroom, two bath, uh, um, multi level condo. Um, with where my my uh, mortgage is only at five hundred and fifty dollars a month, oh and so uh, you can buy a condo for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in Alabama, but you can also make a six figure salary, and so your money go a lot a lot further. There are direct flights from Huntsville to D.C. to Atlanta to Charlotte, and, and to a number of the larger cities. If you you know want to to play a little, uh, at, at, you know in your twenties you're you're really not into really having a family or, or, or all that. But so there's a, a mix of things and opportunities that you could do, whether you're in your early 20s and you're not certainly uh, not focusing on, on starting a family, but you want to be able to save money and take chances on, on entrepreneurship without having to risk everything. Or if you are in your late 20s, early 30s, and you want to start a family, uh, we have, um, you know, our, we, we're focusing a lot more on our education system, uh, and your money will go a lot further. And, and so um, the return on investment is tremendous, while at the same time enjoying uh, the, quali the quality of life uh, of going to other places on the weekend or even enjoying the quality of life um, locally in that community. And so uh, Huntsville is a melting pot. Um, we are our own unique uh, city and community uh, with a lot of opportunity and we're just waiting for some young 20 something year old 30 something year old uh, or, or older uh, to relocate to Huntsville uh, where they you know can really live the American dream uh, at, at little to no cost that's a pretty good pitch uh, especially when you're from California and everything's crazy expensive uh, so what's your future I mean uh, you got you got as you said you have a young family you've been going all around the state um is is it back to education is it politics is it the entrepreneurship uh is it, is so, it, is it just enjoying the microbreweries you got in your district what's your well, what's your future it's a combination of, of, of a couple of things uh i'm not certain that politics is in my future um in fact i'll be making a tough decision here before the 2020 my 2022 uh re-election for the house um as to whether or not i want to stay in politics or go um i have two companies uh, my wife and I um, run, um, um, we just, well, it's a dental practice. She's a dentist. And so I run the business side of the house. Um, but we just, uh, we're launching a dental spa uh, on the eight, uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, and so, and then I own a small um, defense company. And so I would focus on that and focus more on, on family life, uh, but probably moving more into a, a donor category. Uh, of, of donating to uh, infrastructure building uh, and capacity building uh, so that people will have an opportunity to elect uh, their person of choice and and not someone that uh, politicians tell you that you need to vote for and the way and, and, and the and, and get get a work around the gerrymandering and fighting gerrymandering and other things that uh, suppress uh, you know individual rights uh, you know voting rights 
and other things. And so uh, that may be an area that I focus, I really move money in, uh, my money, personal money, into that area to, to really help prepare a better future and, and get more folks engaged. Um, I'm not ruling out politics, but it's very difficult um, when you're traveling, not just in the state, but also in the, uh, throughout the country um, around, uh, you know, trying to get people to look at Alabama. Uh, my issue is that uh, my concern is that um, an investment in one district in California will serve almost an entire state of infrastructure in Alabama. And so I think as, you know, as Democrats and as progressives, um, we like to go where the fine and shiny objects are and where there's an easy win. But I think there should be some consideration into looking and making places like Alabama a testing site to really rebuilding infrastructure around the country. Because if you can rebuild infrastructure or build infrastructure in Alabama, you're guaranteed to build and the learning and the things that you learn from that, it can plug and play anywhere in this country. And so I think that oftentimes we we make the investments and it ends up getting us to it end up being a short game. Uh, the long game is making the hard investments and to really seeing your investment through in a place like Alabama. Uh, one of the problems um, that I see in, in politics in general is that we go to certain states for our presidential candidates and the folks that we consider. We overlook states that have equal, if not better, leaders uh, that have gone through the tough times and that have overcome a lot of obstacles and that has, have the tough skin and the wherewithal uh, to deal with situ difficult situations as opposed to not saying that other places don't have leaders that can do that. But I think that this, our life story in, in the South or in Alabama is, has been that of hard work and overcoming our obstacles and surviving challenging and trying times which makes us a better person, uh, makes us a better leader, more effective leader, more thoughtful leader, and really helps us understand the world better. While in other places, I think that we oftentimes live in a bubble and that we think that uh, the bubble that we live in is the reality everywhere when it's not. Uh, living, um, you know, living in Alabama, being raised primarily by my grandparents, who neither had a car, who and where most people around the country read, have read about peddlers. Um, that's how I grew up. You know, I'm 36 years old, but I grew up on a small farm with my grandparents bartering to peddlers uh, in exchange for eggs, in exchange for other items, grocery items. Uh, what I know about credit as a young man or knew about credit as a young man growing up was going to the local haberdashery or store and putting something on my grandmother's bill and she paid it off at the end of the month. Well, that wasn't building credit that we know it today. But that's what I learned. Hard work where your neighbor or your, the person next to you that lived next to you or live in the neighborhood would discipline you when your parents weren't around or would give you advice when your parents weren't around. Growing up as a, as a Southern Baptist person that grew up and raised in the church, which lays the foundation for me and my values today. And so not looking at that as a negative because of how I was raised and how I was brought up. Because if you're you know, in, some, in another place, I don't judge people based upon where they live, and I certainly would not want them to judge me or paint a picture of my state and my community based upon what they read and the history that they understand. And so uh, that's my um, you know, perception of where we are as a party and as progressives. Uh, and I think that um, when you concede places where the other side don't have to compete, you allow them to double down in places that you're that you think you're solid, but they run a moderate candidate and hoodwink the community into voting for them.
You know, we've seen this where there's no way that in Maryland there should be a Republican governor. There's no way in New Jersey that there should have been a Republican governor. They run moderates in those places. They double down on their investments and they set us back for a number of years. And so until we expand our electorate, until the congressional delegation and leadership, the state legislative leaders are all talking to each other because guess who draw the lines? And so the short game is to win congressional seats. The long game is to win state houses so that you can draw or maintain the congressional seats that you have. And so I think we, we, we play the short game too much. And so until we start playing the long game, um, I see our party being in a, in a peril. Well, I want to thank you for, for doing the hard work and for playing the long game and the short game. Uh, you got to play both in Alabama. And, uh, and I think it's a compelling case you make for progressives all across the country. Uh, and, uh, and I thank you for your work. I appreciate your time and thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders. And keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcast. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we keep this honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast. <laughs>